In this episode, I share a little of my story so that hopefully you can understand your story better. Stay tuned. Hello friends, Pastor Tim Westermeyer here, Senior Pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Good to be with you as always. We're in the middle right now of a number of episodes responding to listener questions. I still have um, a few of those that I I will get to, I promise. Um, I'm going to interrupt that sort of little mini-series though this week uh, with a little bit of a story um, that's actually my story. And I'm doing this for a couple reasons. Uh, Very frequently when we tape these episodes, Tim, who's behind the camera, and I will sit and have conversations and talk about things often that are unrelated to what we just taped. And a few weeks ago, he asked a question about something that prompted part of the story I'm going to share with you now and uh, was struck by it and said, oh, well, you should do an episode about that. And so that's one reason I'm sharing this story. The other is here at St. Philip Deacon during the month of October, um, we are doing four weeks where each of the four pastors is actually sharing uh, something of their story, uh, responding to two prompts. And this was the idea of our new director of adult education, Jen Galley, who's doing an amazing job. If you've not had a chance to meet her, I hope you will. So we, we launched that four-week series on Monday of this past week, and I was the person sharing some of my story. And Jen's prompts to all of us were two. Uh, why do you follow Jesus, and what what difference does Jesus make in your life? And as I shared with that very large group, actually, I have been here 18 years. I've never seen so many people packed into our fellowship hall, so thank you to everyone who came that evening. But as I shared to, with them, there are lots of ways I could respond to those prompts, right? Everything from uh, my own family uh, to, I mean, my mom and dad and my siblings, uh, to my current family, my wonderful wife, Amy, and my four children, to the churches I've been part of, to the education I've had, um, and so forth. I decided, though, to frame it up around a couple of, of ideas. One I called a prayer or an answer to a prayer, um, and the other was a perspective. I think in this episode I'm going to focus only on the first part of that, uh, which is the prayer. And so, um, again, the, the prompt is, why do you follow Jesus? And I, in my own life, when I was very young, well, okay, I wasn't really young. I was maybe in high school. I was a lot younger then than I am now, that's for sure. Um, I read a quote, and I, and this part of the, the presentation, this part of my story is based around two quotes. The, fir- the first quote, which I'll share in a minute, is the sort of the positive, call it a beacon, uh, drawing me to it. The other quote was sort of a warning, you know, avoid this. So dr- try to figure out how to live a life that will f- allow you to respond to this quote. Try to live a life that will allow you to avoid this quote. So the positive quote comes from, uh, sort of ironically, a gentleman who was not a Christian, uh, George Bernard Shaw. I, I remember very vividly in high school, the library I was at, I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago, um, and it was the public library in Wheaton, Illinois, where for some reason I was reading this uh, preface to one of his plays. It's the play Man and Superman. And the quote is this, this is the true joy of life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown in the scrap heap, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of human griefs and ailments, constantly complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I read that, and that quote, as evidenced by the fact that I can still recite it all these years later, uh, hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought to myself right away, and the quote has never left me ever since, that's what I want. I want that kind of life. Again, the, the first sentence is maybe the, the most important. This is the true joy of life, the being used by, for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, right? I was looking for that. Even at that young age, I wanted to find a purpose that I recognized as a mighty one for my life. 
That was the positive quote. The negative quote, um, and it was, and I'll, I, I will read a couple of quotes, but it's actually a short story. It's amazing to me, this is a tiny little book. It's amazing how many tiny little books have had such a profound influence in my life. The book, it's sort of an extended short story. It's The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy, okay? And it's his reflection on death, actually, in, in a fictional form. And it's the story of a judge, Ivan Ilyich, who lives in a way in which everything he does is proper and appropriate, you know, and, and then he finds out in sort of middle age that he's dying. Uh, it's a little unclear why, but it may be some kind of cancer or something. And it, it forces him, Ivan Ilyich, the character in this, this short story, to confront his own mortality. And it is inconceivable to him that he is going to die uh, at a young age. And he says a, a couple of things that, again, st- stuck with me when I read them in the same way the Shaw quote did, only in this time it was a more of a negative, I want to avoid that. So here's one place in the book. He says, this is him speaking himself, what does it all mean? Why has it happened? It's inconceivable, inconceivable that life was so senseless and disgusting. And if it really was so disgusting and senseless, senseless, why should I have to die and die in agony? Something must be wrong. And then this line, perhaps I did not live as I should have. And then he restates it in slightly different language a few pages later. He says this, what if my entire life, my entire conscious life, simply was not the real thing? Of course, that begs the question then, well, what is the real thing? Um, Which he, the book, addresses in some way. But I remember, again, reading that thinking, boy, I don't want to come to an end like Ivan Ilyich when at the end of my life I'm looking back and thinking, I didn't live the way I was supposed to, right? So, again, on the one hand, you've got the, I had the quote by Shaw, this is the true joy of life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. And then they had, I had this kind of warning, uh, as evidenced by the story, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. And I, I mentioned that this part of my discussion of my story I framed up as a prayer. Um, and that's because I think unknowingly, both of those bookends, right, were a form of me praying to God, God, help me discover the true joy of life that you have made for me. And the miracle in my own life, I believe, is that God actually answered that prayer. Uh, In part, by the way, and I I credited her in in the talk on Monday night, and I will do it again here, by drawing me to my wife, Amy, and giving us our beautiful family. And as I said then, if I had nothing else in my life, my life would have been worth living, okay? But God uses us in many different ways in a lifetime, partially through our families and partially through the way we are part of a community uh, and partially through our work, through our vocation. And so for me personally, uh, being called to ministry has, in fact, I have discovered, been the answer to that prayer of being used for a purpose recognized by myself as a mighty one. And I am profoundly, profoundly grateful for God's response to my own prayer, for God leading me to this incredible kind of work, which is such an, an amazing privilege to do. Um, and so, again, that wasn't all I shared, uh, but that was a big part of, again, my story. Um, what I will end with is something I also shared, which is that... Um, The fact that that is my story, the fact that I was called to ministry as a response to that prayer does not mean, I want to be very clear about this, that everyone is called to ministry. As I said to everyone in that room, each of us, and I've preached about this before, is called by God to do something specific in the world that only you can do, right? And so, again, one of the quotes that's been really important for me Uh, in my own life. It turns out that being a pastor means you are 
set apart and sort of different. If you don't believe me, this is evidenced by the fact that if you're a co- at a cocktail party as a pastor and you go up to get a drink or you're at the cheese plate and someone asks you who you don't know, oh, what do you do? And if I respond honestly, they're very often quick to leave. <laughs> they, they've got something where they've got to be. Uh, and that's just an occupational hazard of being a pastor, which I have long ago learned to accept. But it means that I am somehow different. And part of my own story, again, has to do with claiming that difference. And the point here is that you're called to be different as well, in a, in a different kind of way. And so here's the quote I love. This is from Richard John Newhouse, Freedom for Ministry, and it applies again. Um, he's talking specifically about people who have been called to ordain ministry, but it ends up applying to everyone. So listen to these beautiful words. Uh, Those who have been touched by the burning coal from the altar, uh, that's a reference to Isaiah's own call when he was appointed by God as a prophet, and he's corresponding there to uh, the call to, to ministry. So those who have been touched by the burning coal from the altar and whose touch has been ratified by the call of the church must not pretend that nothing special has happened to them. Such pretense is not humility, but blasphemy. It is not modesty, but ingratitude. It is not devotion to equality, but evasion of responsibility. It is fear, the fear of being different. And then this beautiful quote. This hangs on my wall in my office. And when we are afraid, you and me both, when we are afraid to act upon the difference to which we are called, we inhibit others from acting upon the difference to which they are are called. Another way of saying it is that when we respond to God's call in our life and are willing to accept that difference, or in other language, to step into the water, I've talked about this in the life of Moses, um, we, people see that and they're drawn to it and they realize, maybe I could do that in my life as well. Again, in a different way. So the point of this episode is despite it being a little bit of my own story, is not really to be about me. The point of this is to say to you, what's your prayer for your life? What is it that God is inviting you to do? And I'd encourage you to sit with that, um, reflect on it in your own life, and as we encourage people to do on Monday night, find someone you can talk to about your story or listen to their story, because in doing that, in sharing our stories, it turns out that we can discover much more fully what God has in store for each of us. Thanks as always for being with me. Be well, stay in touch, and God bless. 